Hi, everyone. I, uh, my name is David Benjamin, and I have known uh, Alexandra Daisy Ginsburg for, I believe, more than 10 years. And although she is younger than me, she's been a kind of mentor to me in my work on biodesign. Uh, her brilliant framing of complex relationships between people and nature, between technologies and culture, between scientists and artists has always been inspiring for me. Her projects are equal parts, mind-blowing concept and beautiful aesthetics. Her captivating images, videos, prototypes, spaces and experiences often question our current technological and cultural directions. They represent a future with more questions than answers and they leave us with the pleasing but uneasy feeling. In other words, they are excellent examples of design. Dr. Alexandra Daisy Ginsburg is an artist exploring the human values that shape design, science, technology, and nature. Through artworks, writing, and curatorial projects, Daisy examines the human impulse to better the world. She leads a team of architects, artists, designers, and researchers working in collaboration with other practitioners at the forefront of artificial intelligence, biotechnology, chemistry, 3D modeling, astrobiology, and software engineering. Working at a frantic pace, her studio opens four exhibitions just in this month alone. The Wilding of Mars in Moving to Mars at the Design Museum in London, and also at Designs for Different Futures at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The Substitute and Resurrecting the Sublime are currently on view at uh, the exhibit called Nature at the Cooper Hewitt Design Triennial here in New York City. And also on view now at the Vitra Design Museum is the first retrospective, Better Nature. Daisy's work has been featured, uh, shortlisted in for the uh, 2019 Lumen Prize and received honorary mention in the Artificial Intelligence and Life Art category at the Pricks Ars Electronica. Her PhD, Better, at London's Royal College of Art, received the Rector's Award Scholarship. She received the World Technology Award for Design in 2011 and the London Design Medal for Emerging Talent in 2012. Her work has twice been nominated for Designs of the Year, 2011 and 2015, with Design for the Sixth Extinction being described as romantic, dangerous, and everything else that, ex that inspires us to change and question the world. Please join me in welcoming Daisy. Thank you, David, it's very kind words. And it was, we were discussing, it was nine years since I came sat in one of your student pinups and did that again today. And it's really wonderful to be here and learn from all of you. So I have an obsession and the obsession is this promise that I hear a lot from designers and synthetic biologists and entrepreneurs and architects, and that is that we can deliver a better world. And that is, a, in essence, what we think design does. It makes things better. To paraphrase Herbert Simon, we use design to change an existing situation to a preferred one. But the question for me is, what is better? And think about it for a moment. What does it mean to you? Does it mean greener, more profitable, more user-friendly? Well, all of these things at once. Is this better? The PET plastic bottle was invented in the 1970s as a way to hold carbonated drinks. It was better than the glass bottles it replaced. It was lighter, it used less material, it was less breakable. It's better. But of course, it's also much worse. And increasingly, we're realizing how terrible it is for the environment and for our health. But the plastic bottle is just an everyday example of how design and technology can be used to solve a brief and to solve a particular problem and make bigger, new, unexpected problems in the process. And once I noticed this paradox of better, I began to see it everywhere. It's used to sell us everything from pizzas to chemicals to rival political ideologies. It can fit any agenda. But the problem is, is that better isn't the same as good. 
better for some will be worse for, ever, worse for others. It depends on context and people and the exact moment in time it's used. So how can a word that has so much power in our contemporary world not actually have a shared meaning? That is something that I became so curious about, I decided to write my PhD about it, which I can tell you is a terrible thing to write a PhD about because it is the most enormous topic in the world I very quickly discovered. And I realized, though, that whenever we see this promise of better, we need to be asking, what is better? But crucially, whose better is being delivered? And the third question is even more important, is who gets to decide? And this evening, I want you to think about these questions and how they relate to different humans, but also to the non-human. So I spent four years obsessing about dreams of better. And I was asking this question, how do particular dreams get materialized by particular people into things? So how are politics and visions encoded into stuff? And I decided to look at, I've been looking at this field called synthetic biology, a form of genetic engineering for a number of years. And I'd really noticed how these visionaries are able to gather people around them and build institutions and infrastructure. And what I noticed that was that there were maybe three different kinds of better that were emerging that had very different meanings to very different people, but actually were becoming stuff. And the first was the fundamental aim of synthetic biology. It's a kind of genetic engineering, but it was a group of engineers who around the year 2000 specifically decided that they could make biology better. And for them, that meant making biology programmable, predictable, and designable, like computer code rather than something that lives and dies and evolves and reproduces. And this is an example of that school of thought. This is a plate of engineered E. coli that were designed to go dark when they're exposed to light, like photographic film. And it was designed by undergraduate students back in 2004. So it's a very early example of synthetic biology. Then I noticed there's a second group. And for this group, they want to use this better biology to make a better world. And by that, I saw this idea of sustainable abundance, that we could grow sugar cane and feed it to engineered yeast and create jet fuel, and we could just carry on flying around, and we wouldn't have to change our behaviors at all. We could tie the economy to the environment and live a life of plenty. The problem here for me is that we're making the same things, and the same people are making them, just the methods are different. And the third group was the one that perhaps intrigued me the most, and that was a group of scientists and engineers who want to, in my view, make nature better. And that is quite a radical idea, the idea that you could solve nature, that you could improve it, that you could protect us from it and it from us. And so this is an example which is an engineered mosquito that's designed so its progeny don't survive. And it's made by a company called Oxitec and is currently being released in Brazil and elsewhere around the world to combat dengue fever and malaria. But when we ask what better nature is, I start to sort of unravel slightly because there's a problem with this, this sentence. Are we making nature better for us so that we can emancipate ourselves from it, that we can you know, not be troubled by it or make it more functional for us? Or is it about making ourselves better? And again, that's an emancipatory question, saying that somehow we need to kind of level up out of the, the morass of nature around us, or engineer ourselves to improve us, or change the, the, the na very nature of humans. Or is it something perhaps more worthy, which is saving a damaged nature, which again is taking responsibility perhaps for the things that we've done to nature. But again, we come back to the separation between ourselves and the natural world. And this is kind of the problem is that better is a human value and it has human measures. And these don't necessarily apply in the same way to nature. So take these finches, each um, have evolved to uh, to adapt to their locale and to, to find food and, and uh, optimize the length of their beaks or the, the way they can interact with their environment is different. But they're better for their particular context. But better in nature just means survival, and it means survival across a species, and that means reproduction. It doesn't necessarily mean survival of individuals. These finches didn't imagine how they would optimize themselves. In the same way a giraffe doesn't sort of think, oh, I really need a longer neck, and then I can reach those leaves at the top, and then the, so the next generation will be uh, more efficient. But if in this case with biology, 
Adaption is a matter of context and chance. And that's very different to the way we think about design. So you often may see sort of diagrams of, or pictures of the evolution of products, but these are perhaps, you could say, adapted to different contexts and different preferences, but they're all the product of preemptive design choices. Someone has imagined a set of needs and values and sort of designed the thing accordingly. There's an act of imagination, an act of, an act of visioning in the process. And that's what's really crucial, is that there are many betters. The big bottle may be you know, good for uh, the, the plane and the small bottle good for carrying around, but actually no bottle is probably better. But the values that determine each are dependent on context, and many can ex coexist at the same time. And I think what's really crucial then is to find ways to get many perspectives on this problem of better. There is no one better. There isn't a, a, you know, one vision that I can tell you is gonna solve the world and make it better. So instead, I'm going to share with you some of the projects that I've been working on in the last year with my studio team and collaborators that each try to find different vantage points on this problem of better, to help us understand it, to open up new questions and perspectives about this problem. Ultimately, I'd like to argue that thinking about better matters if we hope to make better things. So I'm going to start by showing a video and then I'm going to explain more about this project. Lava fields on the southern slopes of Mount Haleakala, the island of Maui, Hawaii. The turn of the 20th century. The forests are being lost to colonial cattle farming. One tree will be lost forever. The Hibiscadelphus wilderiana. The Hawaiians called it Maui Hau Kwahi, the mountain hibiscus. By 1912, it will be extinct. The habitat lost, the plant lost, the relationship between the two lost. Could we ever regain a glimpse of what was lost? A few years ago, a small group of synthetic biologists at Ginkgo Bioworks, a bioengineering company in Boston, set out to resurrect the smell of extinct flowers. Christina Agapakis, Ginkgo's creative director, went to the Harvard University Herbarium in 2016, where over five million specimens are stored. Searching the collections for extinct plants with her colleague Dawn Thompson, they found 20. Two would hold enough information to unlock the scents of their flowers, each lost due to human destruction of their habitat. A third would reveal what may be an even greater loss. The first specimen was in the Malvasii cabinet. It was the Hibiscadelphus wilderianus, from which she cut tiny tissue samples. The second was the Orbexillum stipulatum, or falls of the Ohio scurf pea, last seen in Kentucky on Rock Island in the Ohio River in 1881, before a dam finally erased its habitat in the 1920s. The third was the Leucodendron grandiflorum, the Weinberg conebush, it was last seen in London in a collector's garden in 1806, its habitat on Weinberg Hill in the shadow of Table Mountain, Cape Town, already lost to colonial vineyards. But this flower may prove to be completely lost. The project is bringing to light that Harvard specimen and possibly specimens in other collections may all be incorrectly labelled. An old feud between two 19th century botanists exposed again. Back at Ginkgo Bioworks, the scientists could begin working with the DNA once it had been extracted from the plant tissue and sequenced by paleogeneticists at the University of California at Santa Cruz. The Ginkgo team identified gene sequences that might encode fragrance-producing enzymes. These sequences of DNA were printed and then they were inserted into yeast, which were cultured to produce the smell molecules. The identity of those molecules was then verified using mass spectrometry, giving a list of the smell molecules that each flower may have produced. Those lists were sent to Berlin to the smell researcher and artist Sissel Tollas. Sissel began to reconstruct each flower's smell in her lab, using the same molecules from her collection or finding comparative ones to approximate those that aren't available. 
We can use technology to reach back into the past, giving us a glimpse of each flower, but we will never know their exact smell. Science can tell us which molecules they made, but the amounts of each are also lost. Building on that contingency, in London, the artist Alexandra Daisy Ginsberg designed a series of immersive experiences to reconnect the lost flowers to their habitats. These draw on the idea of the sublime, the sensation of the unknowable, and exposure to nature's immensity that makes us consider our position in it. Using genetic engineering so we can once again experience a nature that we have destroyed is both romantic and perhaps terrifying. It is sublime. Artists tried to express this aesthetic state in 19th century landscape paintings, but like these images, even the most advanced technology can only give an incomplete representation. In a natural history museum, nature's contingency is trapped in time, the clock of creation and destruction stopped for us to look at. In the installations, each landscape is similarly reduced to its geology and the flower's smell. The human connects the two, and by stepping into this abstract nature, they become the specimen on view. The smells are diffused in fragments and mix in each installation, so every inhalation is slightly different. We can never fully experience the flower in the present without its past context. This is not de-extinction, but a technological sublime, allowing us a glimpse of a lost flower blooming on a hill, on a wild river bank, or on a volcanic slope, the interplay of a species and a place that no longer exist. As the philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy says, the sublime is not so much what we're going back to as where we're coming from. I wanted to show you that whole video because it is the most complex project I have ever worked on. It's much easier to show you that than try and explain how a biotechnology company, a smell researcher in Berlin, and myself in London can end up building vitrines in a town in the south of France where you can smell a lost hibiscus from Hawaii and a scurf pea from Ohio. But the reason we did this was for me, it was a design challenge, was how can you turn something so complex into a tangible experience that just gets you in the gut? You don't need to know about the science behind the project, but how can you feel lost for something that you didn't even know that you missed in, in the beginning? So for me, it was about trying to create a tangible experience through this incredibly complex science, and in a way, bringing it back to this moment of how would you feel to be in a landscape that you could never experience again? And there was also, for me, the perverse fun, and this sort of ir this irony runs through all of my projects, which was getting people inside vitrines. And it's a technological challenge, it turned out. You know, how do you diffuse these smells in these spaces? But also, how do you build something like this that can, um, for someone who's only done an undergraduate in architecture, these are my first buildings, so it's very exciting. But it was also, how do you get that feeling of the museum um, in its simplest in its sort of simplest state? And so we also built a smaller version, which you can, uh, this is what's at the Kubi Hewitt as well, which we call the mini version, where you are still on view, you're still the subject on view as the visitor. So you step inside and the smells are diffusing around your head. There's four different smells that are uh, diffused, so there's a contingency to this experience. There's no one true smell as a result. Um, and tomorrow I'm going to Philadelphia where we're building a new version which is a diorama which will open next week. So playing through all the different natural history museum tropes. And that is something, that, a thread that runs through my work is this obsession with taxonomies and the natural history museum and the need of humans to collect and identify and label nature to make sense of it. And I don't have a science background, I studied architecture and have learned science uh, about science as an outsider. And that's a really interesting way, I think, to experience it. And this project has been such a learning curve because one of the um, kind of strangest things that happens, I've had to learn a lot about botany. So this is the third flower, the Leucodendron grandiflorum. And you'll notice it's in little inverted commas. 
And the problem was is that once I started Googling this flower after Christina had sampled DNA and done this extraordinary scientific work on this flower, I didn't know what flower we were actually looking at. So when you start to Google the name of this flower, you end up with three different flowers. So then the question is, well, which is the real flower? Um, and I had to learn about homonyms, so there's different flowers with the same names, it turns out. And the real flower is actually the one on the right, even though it's called the Eurospermum grandiflorum. And this flower, it turns out, was only documented in this one book written in, so published around 1805, 1806 in London. And one botanist rewrote the botany or the taxonomy of another. And he reported at this sort of foul-smelling plant in a collector's garden in London. And this is the only description of this flower. So, like, okay, we solved the name of the flower. This was lots of emails and help from Q last summer. But then it got much stranger. So, remember, this is a project about resurrecting the smell of extinct flowers. So, our Christmas studio party, we went to Q, because um, that's, like, a very exciting thing to do if you um, like botany. So, we took the whole studio and we went and to look at the actual flowers, because I'd never seen them in the flesh. And the curator botanist, Harry Smith, who was helping us, pulled out the orbexalum, like, oh, it's you know, very beautiful, the hibiscus. And then he pulled out this thing on the right. And he said, and there's your Leucodendron grandiflorum. And I was like, that's very different to this photograph on the left. So what is this thing at Q? Remember, again, Christina has taken DNA from this plant at Harvard, and we have rebuilt the smell of it and are about to put it in a museum. So then I actually finally looked at the label on this plant on the left and realized that it was grown in 1966. So we have now got this problem of a flower that doesn't, it's not possible that it exists because the flower was last seen in London in 1805 or 1806 and this one was actually grown in 1966. The plot thickens. So then, I so, said, well, what has Sissel rebuilt the smell of? What actually are we about to put in this installation? So we found a protea expert in Cape Town. And I'm telling all of this to, to, to show you what ends up looking like a very simple glass box. Turns out to be an international murder mystery for a missing corpse <laughs> that we don't know if it even exists because this flower on the right is this flower on the left that's been verified by um, a protea expert in Cape Town called Tony Ribello. But he said, well, what's on the left? He said it could be anything. It probably could be one of these. And these, to me, look like photographs of things that are not dead. And they grow by the road in, in Cape Town. So whatever this is, it's not an extinct flower because it lived in the 1960s. But where is the Leucodendron grandiflorum? So in the unexpected way that my life goes, it turns out we're now trying to track down a conservation charity in Cape Town who are burning Weinberg Hill. And they were meant to do it last year, but there was a drought, and then it rained too much this year. And the idea is that they've persuaded the landowner to actually clear, who, the landowner who cleared the colonial pine, pine plantation on this bit of hill, and has agreed to let them burn the hill to see if there's any seeds buried in the soil. So now we're looking for seeds of a flower that last grew 200 years ago, but was actually seen in London on a hill with the off chance that it might actually produce the flower we're looking for. But then there's no way to actually check if the flower exists because whatever is at Harvard is not the flower. So this is how you make mysteries. <laughs> and the reason I'm telling you this is because suddenly you realize, um, as you start to build these reconstructions, because this is built in Unreal Engine, is our imagination of the hill at the time of the lost flower but suddenly we've opened up this whole mystery into the construction of science and the fact that colonial botanists went to this place, collected these flowers, and we can only verify their existence by a drawing in a book from 1805. And for me, this starts to raise questions about whether, why do humans need to identify these things to, to know them, to actually, for them to exist? So you can smell this lost flower in the Vitra Design Museum gallery, but it might never have existed. Or maybe it did exist, but it's lost. Or maybe it still lives, and it's going to come out of the soil in a couple of years' time after we've burnt the hill. So that is something I'd like you to watch this space, because I don't think we'll ever solve it. But it's a really interesting way that artists and scientists can start working together and sort of unravel a lot of things we didn't expect to find about how science is constructed. 
And for me, the reason to do this is to start to ask these questions. Each of these flowers was lost by, through colonial action, the building of vineyards, the building of dams, the building of cattle ranches. And what we're left with through this project is an imperfect memory, a trace of something that maybe never existed. But is it enough to remind us to change our behavior in the future, to be better towards other species and other places and other peoples? So this project is, for me, one of the ways I challenge this cone. And anyone who, who's looked into speculative design um, may be familiar with this idea that we can sort of look at preferable and probable um, futures and actually use design as a way to think about what kinds of futures we might like. But for me, this model is wrong. It situates us in a single present looking forward, and we can only choose between the futures that we design or that we imagine that are on offer. It doesn't give us agency to change our behaviors in the present. And I would argue that's where we need to change at the moment. I think that reality looks more like this. It's messy and multiple dreams of better coexist alongside each other. Futures and pasts shape our present, shape our choices and actions today. And you could say that very much at the moment, histories are shaping our future, a particular kind of history. So social imaginaries, dreams of better futures, golden ages, the idea of make America great again, or in Britain, take back control, this idea that we ever had control to begin with, um, or that America was great, according to who? Then to so come back to this question of better. And these questions are subjective. So for me, the Resurrecting the Sublime pro uh, project so sort of sits in this space where we're using histories to think about the present. And I want to show another project now where we're using, in a way, history, but sort of extrapolating into a future. But it's not a prediction or a proposal. It's more of a way to explore these kinds of issues. This project is called The Substitute. And it started for me last year when this picture came to the top of my Twitter feed and well, actually was offered to me as a prediction of what I would like to see. And this is, of course, Sudan, the last northern white rhino male who died last March. I didn't know there was only one male left. And again, I, once he was dead, then I knew, and it was too late. And there's two females left. And I was really struck by this sort of this moment in time that the, like this great creature was gone. But we didn't have to worry because scientists were busy planning to harvest the eggs of the last two females. And this is one of them last summer having her eggs harvested. And the idea was to then inseminate those eggs using sperm that was taken from Sudan and create new baby northern white rhinos. Of course, they would have to be gestated in southern white rhinos because the two females are too old to reproduce. So we're left with this very strange idea where we might have northern white rhinos coming back, but these northern white rhinos don't have any other northern white rhinos to learn from. And as I started to learn more about the subspecies from, um, and these videos are courtesy of a scientist in the Czech Republic who is studying their vocalizations, the northern white rhino was the most social of all the rhino subspecies. So they have a complex culture you know, and ways of interacting. So if you're to create a new technological northern white rhino, how is it going to learn how to be a rhino? Is it a good copy of the species? About this time, there's 23 hours of those videos that we have watched. So um, if anyone wants to watch some videos, I can, <laughs> I've got some highlights on my computer here. Um, at about the same time, though, I came across a paper from DeepMind, the artificial intelligence company. And scientists there had De devised an experiment where an artificial agent, so a piece of AI, would navigate around a box. And they fed the data set to train this agent from a data set of rats navigating around a box. And what they discovered in their experiment was that the artificial agent optimized, it solved the problem of navigation, of understanding where it was in a box in the same way that the mammalian brain has evolved to solve. So using the learnings from rats, it found the same solution. And by that, they meant a very particular uh, configuration of cells in the brain called grid cells. So when we look at a room, we make a hexagonal map of the room, and there's actually cells in our brain that are firing in a similar way. And their artificial agent did the same thing. So I was really 
kind of overwhelmed at this point, that this paradox that humans are so busy creating new life that we completely neglect what already exists. And I couldn't understand how this could be the case. So I was really excited about this research. I'm guilty of it as well. And there's something really interesting, though, about this process of copying, of the artificial agent being a copy of the rat itself. And it reminded me of this image, which is the famous Dura reproduction of this rhino that was drawn in 1515. This was an, an Indian rhino, and it was sent from India to the king of Portugal, who thought it was so great that he then sent it off to the Pope as a gift after about six weeks. And the rhino died in a shipwreck en route, and uh, its carcass, I think, was eventually found and taxidermied somewhere. But Dura heard reports of this rhino. He never saw it, and he drew this image, which became one of the most reproduced images of the Enlightenment. And um, for anyone with a keen knowledge of rhinos, you'll notice that it's got an extra horn on his back amongst strange things like the armor. And this image was reproduced you know, in encyclopedias and books about nature of the time, and it was an error in reproduction. So for me, these dots started to connect, thinking, well, how would we make an archival copy of a northern white rhino that somehow kind of, you know, is the new rhino that's born through IVF actually a northern white rhino, or is it somehow a copy? Um, so the solution for me to think about this was to build my own archival copy of a northern white rhino. So this is at the Cooper Hewitt, um, and the installation is a little bit smaller than this, but he's life-size, and I'll share a bit more um, of what you see. This is a little clip from the video. <laughs> Thank <laughs> Having your own northern white rhino in your server is quite a fun thing. And this project is a very strange one. So I'll just talk a little bit about the processes behind and what you've just seen. So in the gallery, you see this running on a site. There's three cycles to it, and each one is slightly different. And the rhino is actually following the path of the DeepMind experiment. So we were able to use DeepMind's artificial agent experiment and actually generate out paths. So our rhino is essentially performing this experiment. And this is a strange thing to do. And it's a strange thing to ask animators who are used to doing Hollywood visual effects to do something so sparse and so spartan. And we really focused on his behaviors and the sounds. And the sounds were actually taken from those 23 hours of rhino videos, which I was sent 
in a cognac box from the scientist in the Czech Republic. And so you realize that there's this sort of shipping of data and things around the world. The rhino, who's the star of our video, was actually a southern white rhino that was from the LA office of The Mill, which is a visual effects company. And he'd previously been in a energy drink commercial in Brazil. So there was this very nice moment where we then had to remodel him to be a northern white rhino. And so mimicking the, the Dura miscommunications and changes in errors in reproduction, we were able to synthesize this new northern white rhino and make him come to life in front of you as you watch him in the gallery. But then he, every time he disappears. So he comes to life, his sounds are an archival copy in essence, using this real sound from footage, real behaviors taken from these videos of the last eight northern white rhinos in a zoo in the Czech Republic, but then he's gone, and you can't keep hold of him. And it's a really strange experience watching this, because in a way, it's the closest I'll ever get to a northern white rhino, and it's probably the most authentic experience I'll ever have of a northern white rhino, but of course, it's not the real thing. And for me, this project, again, comes back to this question of better. Do we deserve? technologically resurrected northern white rhinos? Why would we look after them when we've already failed to look after the ones that come before? Is it better to have this kind of experience where you can come face to face with something like this and be reminded of the need to protect other, other beings and, and non-human beings and our role in doing that? And for me, this kind of starts to step into a very different way of making work and creating new kinds of perspectives and thinking about how do you prioritize the non-human perspective at the same time keeping the human perspective because without us looking at it, nature doesn't really exist. And so that, for me, kind of comes on to the, the last project I want to share with you, um, which in a way does something slightly different. So I've drawn it like this because it is a project that bifurcates into the future. There are many different ways that the world could be and many different ways that biology could be, and we are just one of them. And this project is called The Wilding of Mars, and it um, has been going on for two years. So I was asked to come up with a project for a show called Moving to Mars that opens next week at the Design Museum in London. And I was told, I don't, know if I, should, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but I was asked to make something optimistic. And I said it's a show about how design can help us get to Mars and colonize the planet. And I'm really not a fan of colonization. And I find it really strange that we talk about colonization in a positive way when we talk about Mars. Because the idea that we're being sold, especially from certain corners of the Mars sort of enthusiast uh, stack is that we can somehow turn it into another Earth, that we can terraform the planet and go there once we've trashed this planet completely. And of course, when you think about it, it is this, it's just flipping the image. Earth is going the way of Mars. And this is not a new concern. So in the 19th century, uh, the astronomer and businessman Percival Lowell got very excited about canals on Mars. Schiaparelli, who was an astronomer, had identified these channels on the planet, and, and they turned out not to be channels. It turned out to be a, an artifact of his telescope. And Lowell, which, again, we see things as we can at the time that we see them. At that time, that was what we knew. What we know about Mars now, maybe we will, in 50 years' time, look back on and think, how did we think that? But we're looking at science. We're using science to look at the world, and we can only understand through the knowledge that we have. But Schiaparelli saw these canals, or channels, and Lull translated it as canals, and he talked about Earth going the way of Mars. At the time, there were already concerns about the effects of industrialization and desertification on Earth, and this you know, very contemporary awareness that we have now of the impacts of our colonial exploitation of the planet were already contemporary then. So for me, the solution to this brief, which was how to make something optimistic about colonizing Mars, was straightforward. Um, but first, I had to think about this question, is why do we think that Mars is going to be better with humans? And crucially, why do we think that humans are going to be better when we get to Mars? I asked my eight-year-old cousin last week about this question, and he said, well, we need to go to Mars to colonize it because Earth is 
like going down the pan, basically, and we need a backup planet. But we probably shouldn't go to Mars, because what happens when we go there and we do the same thing? And I think that's a really good point. So um, I'm more interested in life on Earth and protecting it. But the project, The Wilding of Mars, proposes something radically different, and that is a simulation of seeding Mars with Earth biology in stages, but humans never go there. So this is my solution to the problem of how to fulfill a brief that is optimistic yet critical about colonization is to send plants as proxies. So we've built in the studio a simulation that runs for a million years of biology seeding Mars, creating a wilderness, but humans never go there. So to do this turned out to be really difficult. So it's like a good idea. And then it's like, how do you build a simulation of colonizing another planet when you're not scientists and don't have a supercomputer? So we chose our plants with help from scientists at NASA. And we spoke to uh, planetary geoscientists at Brown and had really amazing conversations that start to open up the problem of doing this is that everything is a speculation, you realize, especially when it comes to astrobiology, because scientists are looking for water-based life on Mars as the result of a political decision in the 1960s, and life on Mars might look completely different. So when you ask a scientist at NASA, well, what, how should we seed Mars? What plants do we start with? And they say, well, actually, I don't know. Um, so we chose 16 extremophiles from Earth that can all tolerate harsh conditions, so from the Antarctic, the Arctic, from desert locations. We designed parameters for them, like understanding their optimal living environments, and we built a simulation according to these rules. So this is upside down to make it easier to read. The South Pole, we would start with um, some cyanobacteria and some other kinds of um, uh, bacteria that would that are dark, that would start to melt the snow. And then we could introduce some lichens and other species that could slowly sort of acclimatize. And after maybe half a million years, we can add a few other things. And eventually, we get a gentle colonization that's taken a million years, and we just watch from Earth. So I'll show you a few clips of it. We just finished it on Friday, so this is a bit, a bit scary. But um, so. This is the year 30,000. You can see there's a clock ticking along the bottom. Not lots happening. There's some snow at the South Pole. If you can read along the bottom on the right, you see evolved and ex extinct. So that's the number of new organisms. And what's actually happening in here, for the eagle-eyed amongst you, is this is plant cam. You can just see there's like a little bit of lichen growing where the label has come up. So this is going to run for an hour in the gallery. And we showed a prototype at the Vitra Design Museum. And in the visitor's book, someone has given feedback that they thought it could be faster. <laughs> so I cannot tell you how difficult this has been to do. So it's really nice to share it with you. This is in the year 452,000. We've got this is watermelon snow, which is a real uh, sort of thing that happens with a kind of cyanobacteria that stains the snow pink. So we've got climate change happening. The South Pole is melting. Meanwhile, this is what's happening yeah, close up. So our plant species are all able to mutate. Um, we have built a system. We're not trying to terraform the planet. Instead, we just need things to acclimatize, and then they start to find their own balance and sort of start to mutate into new subspecies. Um, another landscape. This is the year 152,000. Nothing is really growing there. We've got there's evidence of population zero is happening right now. Um, and if we jump forward, this is. 819,000, we have a meadow. Um, 189 new species, 177 are extinct. So, crucially in this project, and it feels quite mad showing you this because this is the most useless thing I've ever made and it's purposefully so. It has taken so much work from an amazing team of people to do this. And one of the really important things for me this came out of my PhD research was how could you show multiple worlds at the same time? So in the exhibition, you'll see two worlds evolving at the same time, two different ways that life could go. And for me, this project is really based on the Borges short story, The Garden of Forking Paths, where he described a garden that existed in time, 
not in space, that you could get to different points at the same time. And it's a story about contingency. And in biology, when you have a planet, you may actually end up, because the conditions are ultimately the same, you may find life goes in the same direction. Or it could go radically different way. Why is Earth different to Mars? Why do we think Mars is better than Earth, or could be better? Now, one of the mad, again, I use the word mad because this feels like a madness, this project. Uh, one of the crazy things about what we did was once we'd chosen our subspecies, we then were able to design this system where new species mutate. And then you start to realize that in a project this scale, every single decision opens up a new problem. So what do you call things that have evolved on Mars when there's no humans to look at them, when you can only look at them through the surveillance system? So I then had, to, I wrote to some philosophers of biology asking them, well, what would you call stuff on Mars? And one of my favorite responses was, well, you could call them whatever you want because they don't exist. And so, so then I decided that we really had to solve this. I'd been procrastinating for about a year with this problem. So I decided to go for a trinomial naming system, acknowledging the, col the colonial nature of this project. Yes, we are colonizing Mars. We just are not there to exploit it. But we're watching, we're gardening from afar through these sort of surveillance cameras. So the Saxifraga positive I can't even say it, um, ends up with an extra Marsha after it. So we have a new system to catalogue a new planet of biology. And then this is a subspecies, and acknowledging that these are the products of a simulation because they're entirely fictional, as the philosopher pointed out, each one has a barcode um, of its simulation generation number. And you'll notice that they're all getting darker and stranger as, they, as it goes on. And this is part of the system is that things start to optimize to Mars conditions. We're not recreating Earth on Mars. So there are thousands of these, many thousands of them. And um, again, it's the obsession with taxonomy. And this very clear distinction of, well, how do you create another world to reflect back up on our own. How do you ask, well, is this better or is that one better? For me, is at the heart of this project. And it's part of this interest I have in the idea of the heterotopia, the world, uh, the term coined by Foucault about worlds that aren't better or worse, but they're different. And these strange other places that he described, he included cemeteries and brothels and cruise ships as heterotopias. For me, this project is a heterotopia. It's a world that's sort of adjacent to ours, but it's a space to reflect back on our world and a space to ask these questions of, well, is Mars going to be better? And I would say it won't be. Um, and so in uh, the Vitra, we have um, it showing us 12 screens in two simulations. And the, and the design museum is going to be big, uh, four big screens. And I'm very curious how an audience who are expecting to see spaceships are going to react to very slow growing plants. Um, so I'm very excited. So I would like to just sort of finish by talking about this sort of the ideas that underpin what I'm doing, which is this idea of better. And the dreams of better really drive what we do as humans. We are hopeful animals. But there isn't one better. Each of our worlds coexist, futures and pasts inform our choices in the present and direct what we do in the worlds that we make. And for me, one of the most important questions that we need to be asking right now, and perhaps the, the most important question, is what better nature do we imagine for humans and for the non-humans, and how do we get there? And these questions then circle back to this need to interrogate every time you hear these promises that something is going to make something better, that this design or this product or this technology you know, we get to choose these things. We choose who they're better for, or we are dis, you know, disenfranchised and don't get to choose. And that's also crucial as we start to analyze the politics and power structures that actually determine the world that we make. And why it really matters for me is it always comes back to this. It's very simple as you know, someone trained in design is how do we do better than this? I mean, so I would like to finish there and thank you. And if there's questions, I think we're going to talk about them because I think there might be questions about how you actually colonize Mars. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to ask a, a couple of questions, but then we'll quickly open it up to the audience. Um, so get your questions ready. Um, 
I mean, first, I want to say that it's um, impeccable work. I mean, the, the concepts, um, the clarity of presentation, the images, and um, it's great for me to see some of the newer work and your engagement of, for one, all of the human senses. You know, the sounds were amazing. Um, the idea of working with smell in addition to visuals, which have always been there. Um, and your mastery of like almost any technology, um, the ability to engage. I'm not doing it myself. <laughs> well, but, but the, the, the work you're, you're directing, and it all has your direction, your sensibility. Um, you know, much like an architecture yeah. studio yeah. is, you know, it's of the direction of a, a person, but it's not just done by a single person. Um, and so I'm wondering if, you know, as you've been involved in a lot of different educational institutions, and you know, you're teaching now at the at the AA, the Architectural Association. Um, how how do you teach that kind of thing? Uh, well, I mean, I think thank you because that's really nice to hear because these projects are all. I mean, this one is fresh, fresh out of the studio, and they are all the product of a lot of. People. So I have an amazing team in the studio and lots of sound designers and other artists and experts that we work with. So it's very much not a solo venture. And I would really like to stress that. So the way to teach, I mean, I'm learning. So these, pro these projects, in a way, are the outcome of my PhD. So I didn't get to do things at the scale in my PhD, and it's what I would, I was doing PhD by practice, so it's what I would have liked to have done, but there was no way I could even contemplate doing it. Mm -hmm. They're so complex. And the world building aspect, so I was trained in design interactions with Tony Dunn and Fiona Raby at the RCA and did my PhD there, which is very much a course about world building, in effect. And in a way, these kinds of strategies can exist in a single instance, you can design a world, you know, what, what would you drink out of is a way to build, start to imagine a whole world. In a way, the Mars project is taking it from the other angle, and that's my interest in directed evolution is, well, if you have the world already, what comes out the other end? What do designs look like if you can control the system but not actually determine the things themselves? So I think world building can be done at a very small scale. And what has been really exciting with these is testing different ways to actually cut through all the words. You don't need to know anything about this Mars project. Is that there's a fascination that humans have with watching plants grow sped up is enough, I think. Um, but each one, you could start to uncover more and more layers. The rhino, you can just watch it and have this physical okay. sensation. That you don't need to know what's going on and all these layers underneath. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. That's a good point that all of the work that you've presented is has this visceral impact. I think it's really powerful. Um, I mean, um, along those lines, because world building is, I think, a really helpful term. And I was thinking about, you know, our, our mutual friend, Paolo Antonelli, lectured kind of at the school, uh, sponsored by the school, but over at the School of Arts a couple of days ago. And she there was talking about, and she's always been doing this, kind of blurring the line between architecture and design and also many other fields. Um, and I think your own history has been a kind of blurring of the lines between architecture and design. Um, do, you, do you see the distinction as helpful? Do you see us moving in a direction of those kind of terms being less relevant? Do you think there's some things that are specifically design and others that are specifically architectural, or is that not a... Well, I've been fighting to call myself an artist at the moment, because that, yeah. for me, feels transgressive somehow and fun. Um, because having been a critical designer and an arch you know, sort of, uh, architect in training, all these different things, and in a way that feels true as to what I'm trying to do. I'm very interested in design and why we design stuff as humans. What is this urge to make things is the interest of you know, the driving behind it all. Um, but the labels are not so important. I mean, my practice, my studio, I have three escaped architects working in the studio. So they all want to practice, but not necessarily make buildings and see a problem with the future of architecture. And it's the same problem that I identified when I was training in architecture, that somehow 
my interest in the ethics of design didn't match up with the reality that I knew lay in wait for me as a practicing architect. And while I love buildings, I don't think I'd be a very good architect. So you have to really like details, drain details, and I prefer <laughs> naming plants. So this was a much better fit for me. And I think that's important because I think what we're doing in the practice is probably also still architecture. We're just finding a very different way of doing it. We're building yeah. things, we're making things happen. The time scales are much shorter and the impact on the built environment is different. But I think it's still relevant to practice across design and architecture and art practice. Yeah, I mean in many ways it's, it is, as you said, architecture and it's, it's compatible with the kind of, again, world building that we might uh, do in the in this school. Um, I want to pick up a little bit. I have maybe one or two more quick questions. But um, so yeah, the ethics of design. I mean, there was this layer of of those questions that you're asking and the critiques that you're making in your work that have this clear aspect of ethics. And I I really like that you were talking about the agency to change behavior in the present. Um, and I wonder um, if, if in that context, um, if you, for one, watched um, Greta Thunberg's UN summit speech. I've just seen I, clips of it, but I'm very okay. supportive. And, and so, you know, so I, I'm saying that just <laughs> as a kind of, so that's one kind of, you know, urgent call yeah. to change the mm. present, to change yeah. our actions in the present. Um, and so I'm wondering in, in architectural work or in artists' work, in design work, and, and also in your own work, but I'm asking you to also think mm. about just those fields in mm. general, um, what role do you think there is or what space do you think there is to kind of carve out for this kind of more specific activism or a, a very clear and tangible call to action um, where a lot of our work, you know, in this school and I think why it's so compatible with your work is questioning things and that's what we, we think is um, you know, a good way to pursue a project. It's to open up more questions than provide answers. But at the same time, I think there is this nagging aspect in many of us individually and in the current work at the school and in your own work about needing to find the right connection to a specific call to action, not just problematizing the, the you know, the way we're doing things now but having a specific call to action. And I wonder if you, if you have thoughts about that for these fields in general or about your own work. Well, I can talk specifically to my own work that it's deeply problematic. I'm not solving any environmental problems, climate breakdown. I'm shipping rocks around the world, <laughs> building steel and glass vitrines, and, it's re and I'm here talking about it, and these are all really problematic parts of contemporary practice. On the other hand, you know, I would be better off joining Extinction Rebellion if I really wanted to make an impact. But what Extinction Rebellion are doing is their storytelling. Yeah. And I met a wonderful conservationist called Kent Redford, who's part of the, um, the Wildlife Conservation Society. We were sitting, having breakfast in university halls at a conference in Singapore, and I was eating this horrendous processed sausage that was just terrifying, these weird scrambled eggs, and just thinking how synthetic this whole breakfast was, sort of sitting on my plate, terrifying me. And he said, you know, Daisy, the thing is, is that we've run out of time. There's, it's too late. It's too late to do anything, but what, all we can do now is tell stories. And he's like, please, can you tell more stories? Because that's the only, the only thing that's left. And that stuck with me. That was three years ago. And so these new projects are all really trying to think about how do you tell the skills that I have and the kind of work that I have the privilege to do, what are the stories that I can tell and how, what are different ways we can experiment with getting people to react. So this is what I can do. I could go and sit outside my studio at Somerset House on Waterloo Bridge and actually be part of the blockade, would probably be more useful. But this is also, I think it does have use. And 
if it gets people talking about extinction in new ways, then that's valuable. Yeah, well, it, it makes me think, too, about the need for a diversity of approaches. And you talked mm -hmm. about a kind of diversity in your talk. And even going back to Al Gore's original inconvenient mm -hmm. truth, it still sticks with me, that graph of, like, you know, there's no single technology or solution that's going to solve it. We need to work on these wedges. And, like, we need to have a lot of wedges. And, um, and I think it's a good point. I think one of the reasons Greta is so powerful is her own version of storytelling. Mm -hmm. It's not that her as one person is skipping school. Mm. It's the story she's been able to tell and captivate people by. Um, I have one more question, and then we'll open it up to the, the audience. Um, I don't know. For some reason, this, this feels almost too like trite to ask, but I'm, I'm genuinely curious to hear your thoughts and your answer about it. Um, what would be like an ideal like a dream next um, commission for you, whether it's curating or m making a specific work of art or entering a new field. You, you already said you probably wouldn't want to do a building because of the drainage details, so maybe you don't want to do a building, but maybe a different, <laughs> kind of, different kind of building. Or, um, you know, do you think about, like, what if... What if you, well, I know what I want to do next, okay. so I can't say because it's secret. Oh, no. But okay. um, more of the same, I'm really enjoying... So this is... All of this work has been made in the last year and a half, which is crazy, and... I had a practice before, I went back to do a PhD, and that's how we, we first met, working on a project called Synthetic Aesthetics, where I was embedded in synthetic biology, which left me questioning, well, what, what do I do now? Like, where does this leave me? I was weirdly integrated inside a field that I was trying to be political about and critical of, and that is, you know, I'm still working with synthetic biologists, but I needed to reframe what I was doing. So these projects have all happened, and now I want to carry on making projects like this because it's so fun, but it's also crazy. And I'm learning about the practice of being an artist and building installations, and you know this much better than I do, having built towers of mushrooms. It's really difficult, but the challenges are amazing. And if you can find ways to do it, then it's, it's you know, for me, there's a huge pleasure that I'm doing, making work about something I really care about whether it's sustainable as a practice, whether it can be sustained, and whether there's avenues for this kind of work is, you know, that's the mystery. But um, it's really, it feels like it's worth trying at the moment because I get to tell stories about nature. That's really nice. Yeah. Powerful <laughs> stories. I'm kind of interested in aesthetic theory, and I've got a question regarding your practice as an artist, which you said yourself. Maybe you identify as that or not, but um, so there's a body of literature in aesthetics that kind of defines it as something that's got the ability to produce the unthinkable, right, and to open doors. Um, and so it sparks ideas, new knowledge by offering us a vision of something that we didn't know. And so um, that's kind of how you come to produce a new notion of what's better, in, in a way. And that's kind of different than producing a notion of better that is like a game theory model of um, morals and such things. And so, my question is for you is, is art supposed to investigate the world and tell us um, some truths about the world so with your work in science? Or is it more, are we going to like produce new ideological tools with those stories? So are we, are we telling, are we doing, are we educating or are we just producing a new, a new story, just like we produce ideologies. I can only talk about my personal view on this, which is that I think that, I mean, I see this practice of art that I'm engaged in as a means to create reflection, 
and new perspectives. So in making these projects, for example, the substitute, it's a slightly messy project because there's multiple different strands coming together. You end up with this huge rhino, but he's walking the path of an experiment and he's coming together. There's all sorts of different layers in there. But that's also me trying to work out stuff along the way. It's not a perfect answer to the question. But it's, and in doing that, I learn new things and I hope that people looking at it notice other things or, or feel other things or find out other questions they have. To me, the questioning, they're tools to ask questions, but they're not just questions in your head, they're questions with your body. So there's a physical experience and also trying to scale up my practice, I'm really interested in how you access the bits that the brain isn't necessarily, you know, like the gut feeling, the, the sense of loss, the emotional connection. If, if someone's crying in a vitrine with the smell of a lost flower, I'm, I'm happy because I've done my job um, of creating a, an emotional experience without having to use any words. And it's not necessary, they may not be crying about the flower, they may be crying about something else, just they happen to sit down on a rock and have a moment. But that's a really, um, to me that's what art can do. And what I like art to do is create a new perspective on the world for me and let me see something differently. But that is not a, uh, I have not studied aesthetic theory. I, <laughs> so please forgive me. I just really wanted to say thank you. Um, it's been a while to, since I've kind of sat at a lecture and, you know, had it, you know, um, David Benjamin's kind of last question, or next to last question, really put things into perspective for me in terms of the fact that you're asking kind of the world's most pressing questions um, and who kind of um, gets to say what those questions are. You kind of like authored and, and took the personal liberty to be able to ask those questions and I think that's super exciting. And I love the fact that you kind of said, in a way, like all of these projects are, you know, in some way, I don't want to say worthless, but from- I, I said useless. Useless, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'm saying is that I definitely don't think that they're worthless by any means. Um, it's exciting because for me, you know, I've been a part of this institution for three years now, and I've borrowed $200,000 to be able to be where I am today and like sit here and ask you questions and speak to people like you and um, it's refreshing to know that you know the questions that you can ask as as for me the real questions that I want to ask like what is our you know role in um, post-colonial Africa as an architect and you know the lack of architects that um, exists there and the pressing need for urbanization and kind of like what's your role as an architect it's a very difficult question to ask and every day I think about how one should kind of participate in that world or whether we should be participating in that world at all it's like my obsession for the last three years and like why I've spent the money that I have to go here etc and it's just really really refreshing to see that somebody out there is asking questions that really don't necessarily have answers, but in one way or another, you've come to a very uh, fine-tuned like, presentation and resolution to questions that have never been asked before. Which Thank you. It really gives me like, energy to push forward and you know, attempt to answer these questions, whether it's right or wrong. Um, it's exciting. Thank you, that really means a lot. The three questions, the better questions, I mean, that was, it took me four years to identify those really simple questions. So, I mean, it's a design project in itself, was how to find out what the question, the, what is the simplest possible question that can be most easily communicated. Um, so, although the work is super complex and goes into these rabbit holes of dead plants and other things, it always comes back to, like, for me, it's how to talk to different audiences, how to be able to go and speak to synthetic biologists or artificial intelligence experts when I don't know the stuff and also seeing value in the naive outsider questions. For me, that was really important. Um, scary, but very helpful process. So 10 years ago, starting out being like, well, why would you do that? And it turns out no one actually asked that question in that way in a lab. 
So being that person actually is a very powerful thing and being willing to ask and to learn. So um, yeah, don't just the, the scale of ambition is, is like extraordinary. I've done a whole planet now. So yeah, I, I know. Like <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I, I just want to ask, um, I saw the uh, experimentation on the Mars about the plants and I thought it was really interesting because um, you showed that there are, I, I remember like some of the numbers, like there are 300 some species that are existing and there are like 150 species extinct. Um, I'm wondering what's the general reason for the extinction of those species? Uh, well, so on Thursday last week it said died. And on Friday, I thought, oh, I forgot that word, it was extinct. That was the word we were looking for for the last six months. Um, so we built a system in the game system, so it's built in Unity. There are harsh seasons. So life's not perfect on Mars, even if you're a lichen. So harsh seasons come in and kill everything off. And we had to have a mechanism, we didn't have to, but not everything is going to survive. It's minus 70 on Mars, it's really terrible. You don't want to be a plant even there, it's not going to be fun. So the whole thing is not necessarily going to work if you actually want to wild Mars. Um, I've spoken to someone whose job it is to not contaminate Mars and showed him the project and he's like, yeah, I don't think it's going to, maybe you get like a little patch by a rock of contamination, but you're not going to have meadows. So the extinction was also to point out that the system balances itself out. It's an ecosystem. So each of our plants is contributing to three parameters of temperature, water, and nutrients, which are kind of global and local parameters. So each one is helping raise the temperature and make it better for plants. But then you've got to, you've got to kill them. I guess it wouldn't be so life otherwise things <laughs> if it worked perfectly. So it's kind of like... Like, I feel like it's kind of like the, the notion of only the stronger plants will survive. Yeah. Yet, um, in the one of the first slides, you showed that one of the extinct uh, plants in Ohio, I believe, mm. and you said they, they weren't extinct because uh, a dam was built. Uh, yeah, so actually that plant went extinct in, it was last seen in 1881. Mm -hmm. um, it was first identified in 1835, last seen in 1881, and the dam was built in the 1920s. So they never found another specimen of that plant apart from on, on this one island. So when they failed to cultivate any specimens that they'd collected from the island and it died out on the island, and then the, the island was flooded 40 years later, there was like no hope for it to ever come back because it was such a localized specific plant. And our, our Mars plants are also localized and specific. So we have maps on every terrain um, so according to the geology of the terrain, where things like like to be in the shade or in the in the light, it's wild out there. Okay, <laughs> I'm just uh, curious about how how do you determine that a species is extinct? Because uh, what we do, if we do mm. something bad, a species species will go extinct, mm. or is it just a choice of nature? Extinction is good; it makes room for more stuff. Yeah. So the um, the Mars project is based on that Borges short story, but it's also based on an experiment by an amazing scientist called Richard Lenski, who's been running an experiment since the 1980s called the Long-Term Evolution Experiment. And he took a plate of E. coli and split the population into 12 flasks. And his lab, ever since the 1980s, have been monitoring these 12 parallel worlds every day and tracking the genetic diversity and how each world develops. When you start to look at the, the graphs that come out of this, and they're very pretty, some of them, because they show explosions of diversity, but the world is always contained because the media is the same, the flask that each population is in is the same. So there's genetic diversity, explosions, things die out. And that's just, that's just the mechanism of biology. So in the wilding of Mars, Mars becomes a repository for the mechanism of life, and that includes losing things. So does it matter that a rhino, the northern white rhino is extinct? It doesn't matter at all. Like we care. I care, because it's quite cute. But um, it doesn't really matter to the history of biology or the future of biology. It will just go another direction. So extinction doesn't matter. It's that if we want the world to be as it is now and to continue, then it matters. So that's about what we think is better.
Thanks. Hi. Uh, I have a question regarding the Mars experiment that you did. Uh, I think, uh, like, since you deployed a lot of elements in Mars, I was wondering, while, like, when you were doing it, since you were the director of it, what do you think? Um, Any time, like, did it come across your mind, like, what kind of culture it's going to create? Is it, since it's a controlled uh, experiment that you are trying to simulate, uh, what do you think? What kind of culture would you create, or what are you, what what kind of culture are you creating, or something similar to that? You mean for the plants or uh, for humans? Based on your experiments, mm. like you are, like you're doing a bunch of experiments, like from macro to micro scales, and I was particularly excited about your experiment on Mars and. Uh, since you are deploying a lot of these elements to grow and make it look like Earth, I was fascinated. What kind of culture are you trying to create or what kind of unpredictable culture do you think it's gonna create? Well, we've, I mean, I'm not sure I fully understand. The experiment itself, so the simulation, when we run it, we get new things emerging each time. Um, but they all, because of the nature of the project, and it's not a one-to-one -one mapping of Mars or a full scientific experiment. So we had to work with the constraints that we had in an artist studio. Um, but you, so you start to see similar things. It's not a lot. It's not as much variation as you would like. But for me, the real cultural outcomes that are interesting are people's responses. So. Um, when people say, oh, it's really slow and boring, it's like a million years just went past in an hour. That's a really interesting response of humans like, to, to reflect on that. Or people say, well, but we would go there in the end. No, no, the project just says that we will seed Mars with biology and watch it. But we'd go there in the end. When I went to MIT to the Beyond the Cradle conference with all these astronauts and people from NASA, and they're like, but we'll go there. No, but, and that's, the, for me, is the cultural reflection of the project, is it reveals that humans cannot help themselves but want to exploit things, and that's part of our nature. So, but I don't, so I'm not sure I fully understand the plant thing, but, um, or the culture within it, but it's... I, I was more trying to get, uh, like, once it develops, since, like, all elements on Earth developed natural, like, like all the elements has its own culture, like birds and animals and us, trees. And uh, so when we create this artificial simulation, I was more interested in Mars, how would people or plants or animals that's gonna be there, what kind of, what sort of culture would you think that's gonna be there? I don't know, I mean that's, part of where our like, imagination has to come watching it. So, I mean, the whole thing is a fiction. You watch it and it's everything that you get from it is your own imagination, apart from what I've directed you to think, because I've you know, art directed it in specific ways. Everything else is what you're superimposing onto that world, which reflects you. I don't know what the plants are thinking or their culture um, in the same way that what we know about trees and how they communicate we now know more because the research is being done and we know that they're communicating, but five years ago we just thought they were trees. Um, no, I'm being, I'm, like, I'm being facetious, but you know, the, so the, the growing knowledge that the trees are interconnected and stands and communicating with each other. And that's what I, the point I was making before, that we can see, we see the world through the lens of what we know. And so we can see canals on Mars, we can see communities of plants, but the wilding of Mars, the purpose of documenting it through these botanical tropes and using the Linnaean taxonomy and is all about reflecting on the way that we see the world. It's just holding a mirror up to our own view, our own perception, and our own culture. I think we have Thank time you. for one more question. Um, I hope the hands have been changing. <laughs> okay, go ahead. 
Hi. Uh, I just wanted to ask you, because you were talking about taxonomy is, and diorama, are there other tools, scientific tools, that you think are interesting to look at as architects or designers, artists? Uh, well, I, don't, I love museums, so um, anything. But I just like cataloging things. So for me, anything with a label is exciting. Anything in drawers is exciting. In boxes, people in boxes, animals in boxes. There's like a lot. <laughs> Scientific diagrams, corrupting scientific diagrams. So one of the, my graduation projects 10 years ago was I added an extra kingdom to the tree of life and then took it to show scientists and to talk about how synthetic biology might need its own domain. And then I had an amazing conversation with a Nobel Prize winning scientist who wanted to use it on the cover of a journal. And he was like, could you correct this inaccuracy because you've added this bit called that says root because I just copied a picture of like a diagram of the tree of life, and I didn't really know what the labels meant. He's like, if you remove that, it would be more accurate. And I was like, it's got a big extra kingdom that I've just put on the front. It's going on the front of a scientific journal. So anything is fair game. But what is important is to know why you're using it. And then you don't need to know everything about it, but it becomes a really useful tool to then go to experts to say, why is this wrong? Why is this right? So I ended up taking my tree of life to a workshop of tree of life scientists who are really, really, they like fighting about clades and how things are organized. <laughs> so I got them to redraw it, and it was a really good way to get people who professionally tax, no, design taxonomies and argue over taxonomies to talk about the impact of synthetic biology on the natural kingdom. So anything is fair game. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing. Uh, I have a question. Uh, wondering, like, uh, you did the all three projects. Like, I'm wondering, like, is this three project find you, or you created this like a three project original? Like, uh, what kind of passion you will find this kind of extinct flowers, rhinos, like uh, all these kind of things? Because uh, you know, but botanical nature is uh, huge, and all the questions about better. There can be everything from a little micro stuff and to a lot of things, but why these three projects like specifically come to you, or like what kind of uh, this kind of things? Like, oh, what's yeah. the, your original passion to create yeah. these three projects? Yeah. So Thank the Mars, you. the Mars project, I was asked to come. You know, it was asked to pitch a project for an exhibition. Um, so I didn't really want to do anything about Mars, but then the brief was so delicious that it had to be optimistic that this was just it was too good to not find a way to to not do it. Um, and then the rhino was uh, commissioned by the Cooper Hewitt, but I proposed the project because the whole thing started when I read about Sudan, read this paper that someone forwarded me from DeepMind and then was on a panel about artificial life with someone from DeepMind. I was sitting there having an out-of-body experience thinking this is so weird because we were talking about artificial life, could we, should we, would we? And meanwhile, this rhino had just died and I found it very strange that we were talking about whether the, we could ever simulate consciousness. And the project sort of emerged out of that, and I wrote a, a proposal on these ideas of what it could be. And the flower project, um, so Christina Agapakas at Ginkgo, they'd been working on it for a few years, and I was aware of it. And they were going to, they'd finally finished the science behind it, so, so two years in. And then I'd been talking to Sissel, because I've known Christina and Sissel also for a decade. And I said to her, I really want to make the smell of the sublime with you? Like, what's the most extreme smell that we can make? And she was like, okay, but Christina's finished the flower project, so maybe we could do that. <laughs> so no. But it was a really nice way because, and that's where the reference to the sublime came through, because when Christina said to me, actually, we've found this, um, the molecules, we've actually, it worked. Our idea that we could do this worked. Then it became, well, actually, for me, that is the most extreme and terrifying and awesome experience when I heard that on the phone. So the project came from there. So they just tend to come from ideas, weird ideas. There's no, no rhyme or reason. You were just talking about, um, is it possible to make the most extreme smell? Um, in the course of your work, have you ever had to think about or even compromise on the science for the sake of effect? Because you are an artist and your medium is effect, creating an impact on an audience, and if the science doesn't support um, an impact, say the smell of one of the flowers was almost utterly unrecognizable, have you had to think about changing aspects of the way you project 
your art to an audience versus the science that forms its background? Mm, that's really interesting. I'm not communicating the science, so I'm not trying to do that. I'm telling stories and reflecting on the science and asking mm -hmm. questions about it. So that doesn't come up in that way. Maybe an example is um, a new project that we're working on that I can't talk about yet that involves machine learning. And we were working with a string theory physicist to do the machine learning. And he said, well, what happens if it doesn't work? I said, well, it will work. He said, but what happens, okay, it's like really difficult what you want to do, what happens if it doesn't work? I'm like, well, it will work because our measures of what works are different. So in this project where we're actually using science and how, you know, did sort of training for months, um, we're not making science. It turns out that the research that he did to make the project is probably useful, useful scientific research and kind of some groundbreaking stuff, but the outcome is different. So mm -hmm. the smell project, I mean, I, sh I showed you the inner workings. One of the flowers may not even exist. Mm -hmm. It may not be extinct or it may be extinct. We don't even know, but it's not, we're not just communicating science. It's, it's there's more room for maneuver, I think. But it's a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. and, and that's an interesting way to kind of wrap up because I think um, the idea of a project that can be both art and storytelling as well as scientific research seems like a, a perfect kind of sweet spot for the kind of collaborations that you pull together. And um, re reflecting a little bit on my own question, my own last question to you, um, I can't wait to see one of your next works, which I'm not sure if it would be your, your dream commission or not, but which would be either a kind of multiplayer interactive video game or a feature film? Oh, I'll take both. Okay. <laughs> so thank you very much, thank Daisy. You.